afternoon, everyone. And like, like Charlie said, they did save the best for last, and there's three other guys after me. So you know, the best is still the best is still yet to come. And I'm uh, thank everybody for sticking out the whole day and for staying to the end. The last four speakers definitely we have some good, you know, some really good solid stuff for you know for you. So let's get started with it. So dealers in the room. Every, all dealers in the room, dealers, general managers, anybody, please raise your hand. I want to see everybody that's in the room right now. Excellent. I want to start by asking a question. Today's the fourth, right? Today's the fourth of the month. So only a few days ago, in your email, did you get the email that came from the manufacturer that showed how many cars you reported with everybody else, right? Everybody got this email? By show of hands, how many of you looked at that email, looked at your name on that, on that email, on that list, looked at the number next to it, and said, yeah, that'll do. Not a one. Not a one. And that is the thing that I absolutely love and adore about this business. It's the fact that no matter what it is that we do, no matter what we accomplish, no matter what goal it is, we always want more. And it's not more from a selfish point of view. This is, a part, this is something that a lot of people take the wrong way about, you know, about people that are in the car business. It really doesn't have anything to do with more for greed. It's more because of the fact that we know that we can do more. It's more because of the fact that we know that we can excel, that whatever it is that we did, whatever number we looked at, we knew there's a couple more in there. There are a couple more deals in there, a couple more people that we could have helped, a couple more people we could have put into cars, right? So what I did is over, oh, really formally over the last six months, okay? But really over basically my whole life, I started going to, you know, I had some, I tell the joke, I had somewhat of a dysfunctional childhood because I grew up in a car dealership, right? So at, at age 11, I started going to work with my father. He was a prep mechanic at a Lincoln Mercury dealership. This was back in the 80s. So you know, like in the 80s, you could do shit like that. You bring your kid to work with you, like that was okay. Now, anybody brings their kid, right? Like, poof, head explodes, not gonna happen, right? Um, but because of that, you know, because of that fact, I grew up in the culture of a, de you know, of a dealership. And I grew up in the culture of a dealership in the early 80s, okay? How many of us were in the business in the dealership in the early 80s? Okay, you know exactly what I'm, one guy, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We can compare scars later, right? For the rest of, for the rest of you that weren't in the business at that time, it was dog eat dog, it was what anything goes, it was just like no holds barred, you know, pretty much at, at, at any extent. So I learned, I basically learned wrong, right? But the thing that I was really blessed by was that that was a, an extremely high-performing dealership. And then, 21 years ago, when I opened my first business, when I opened my first advertising agency, of course, in the car business, right? Dealing with car dealers. When I did that, I was also blessed because I was in no, at that time, I was in no way, shape, or form qualified to work on these, you know, on accounts like this. But I was blessed by having clients that were high performers. And through the years of working with dealers, you guys, you, you love to ask a lot of questions, right? You absolutely love your, and the questions are pretty much, they're always the same. And the questions always have a lot to do with somebody else. So it's always questions like, you know, oh, how many salespeople does that guy have? Right, or the one I get all the time is, you know, hey, how much is that guy spending on Facebook ads, AdWords, you know, TV, newspaper, how much is that guy spending, right? We all wanna know about each other. But for some reason, internally, we don't tell each other much. So what I did was formally over the last six months, I spent time with very, very high performing dealers, basically in conversation, told them about this talk. I'm actually going to have this talk, you know, at a few other conferences coming up. This is the first one. Um, and told them that I was going to do this and said, you know, what are the things, what are the rock solid things that you know that you did right that got you to this point, that got you to perform at this level, that got you to this type of volume, that got you to whatever it was. 
I took those, I put them together, and I put them in this presentation. Basically, yes, you can sell 1,000 cars a month. Because in the business, we hear about dealers that sell 400, right? 600, 800 car, 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 cars. But we think it's myths. We think it's not really true. We think there's a lot of fleet in there. We think it's mostly used. We think this or that. But the fact of the matter is there is a lot of dealers that are performing at that level. Okay? So let's, we only got 20 minutes, so let's get into it. I'm just going to skip right past here. The first thing that every single dealer had was they had the vision. They had the vision of whatever number it was that they were going to get to or whatever goal it was that they were going to hit they had that vision in their mind that they were going to do it. A dealer just last week told me the most important part of that vision is that before, and this is a quote from him, before you can be acclaimed, you need to proclaim. And he is always saying, right, we are going to do this. We are going to be number one. We are going to be the number one Ford dealer in Florida. Where does all that come from? What was, Ali's, what was Ali's most famous quote? I am the greatest. And then afterwards, when he retired from boxing, he added to it, right? That he said, I always said I was the greatest even before I knew I was. So, before you can actually acclaim, be acclaimed, you need to proclaim yourself. Number two, every single one of them built a team. They all built a team in their store. You notice that that, very, very important, you notice that that doesn't say staff, right? You notice that that says specifically, it says team. This is one that all 12 dealers that I talked to said the exact same word. They all said, I built a team. I asked them all, what was the most important part of the team? All of them, once again, the exact same response, the leader. Because every team, no matter what it is, a sales team, a sports team, right? It, every single one of them has to have someone that everybody that's on the team follows and someone of authority. One dealer, and this, this was actually just yesterday, right? Um, just yesterday I added the next slide in because he told me, he says, you know, there's one point that, that I really want to tell you because there was a big mistake that I made for a long time, right? And he said, one should never, ever undermine second guess or overrule the leader in public. Never. He said that was a huge mistake that he made time and time again, where he had a general manager or he had a sales director or he had somebody and they would be in a meeting, they'd be talking about something, he'd be sitting there and he'd overrule them right on the spot. What are you basically doing? You're basically castrating the guy, right? It's over. No one from that point is gonna follow him Everyone, whenever they have some type of a beef, what are they going to do? They're going to run right to the owner. So that, I, I thought that was very good that he shared that. Number three, build and then trust the process. This one came from the first, first dealer that I spoke to, a very high volume Toyota dealer, right? It was all about the process. He learned the hard way because he grew up in a store coming up through sales. When I say grow up, I don't mean like a kid, like dysfunctional and stupid like me. I'm talking about like as an adult when he first started selling cars. He worked at a store where there was basically no process. He said it was agony, but he didn't realize that he was in agony until he went to the next store, which was corporate owned, which was all process driven. He had no idea how many cars he could actually sell until he actually got to a place that had a rock solid process in place. Dealers, general managers in the room, who's got a rock solid process in place? You do? That's great. Awesome. Awesome. So you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly what he was talking about. The importance of that process. Another dealer gave me this quote word for word, right? The best processes are the ones 
where the guests do not feel they are involved in a process. Another dealer told me something that was really good. I, want to, I didn't put it in the presentation, but I want to share it with you. She told me, she said, when somebody comes up to you after they've bought a car, and they come up to you and they say, thank you, that was fantastic. That was the best experience I ever had. Joey was great. That's when you know you got it. Because they don't, the customer actually doesn't realize that they were put into a process and they went through the process completely. To the point of where they come to you when they thank you, that's when you know you're there. Moving on, number four. They realize that people are their greatest asset. Not their real estate, not their facility, not their franchise, not their inventory, their people. Once again, dealers, general managers, you come outside, you know, you get, to, you get to the store in the morning and you see that there's no cars there, there's nobody in the employee parking lot, what are you doing? You're freaking out. You're saying, my God, there's nobody here, what, what the hell's gonna happen? What happens even as sales managers when we walk outside and we look and there's one guy missing? What do we instantly say? Where's Jimmy? Because you know that you need everybody on your team to be there and to be present. Let's take another really good quote from someone where he said, I don't want them to conform to my process. I want them to transform into better people because of it. This was amazing. I love when I, and this is a current client of mine, I love when I get to go to the store and have meetings with them on a day when they have a sales meeting with their staff. This place has three a week. It's almost like church on Sunday. Like church on Sunday where everybody is like totally, totally into it. I go in there, and I, I wanna take ups when I'm done. Like, I, okay, I don't wanna do marketing anymore. I wanna go back to selling cars again because these guys got it right. And what do they talk about? They don't talk about closes. They don't talk about basically anything that has to do with that. It's all about how are we gonna service people? How are we not servicing people the way we should? Somebody actually, the manager actually called out one of the salespeople and asked him, did you call your wife yesterday? Did you call your wife and tell her that you loved, tell, him, tell her that you loved her? Why? Because he realizes that the culture of the store is going to wind up making, lifting everyone and making the whole store better. Number five, this was a really big one. They never, ever make excuses in any way. I learned this one a long time ago. The first extremely high-performing dealership that I worked with had three locations. One of them sold 1,500 cars a month. The other one sold 1,000 cars a month. The third one sold 120, like clockwork. They were at that number. I was at the 1500 car store and we, it was a month when we were thinking that we were gonna crack that like 1700 number. We didn't crack it. Meeting afterwards, what do I do? I come up, I've got a list of excuses. I didn't have enough paper to write them all down. Right? And I got stopped dead with, well, we're not talking about the excuses. We're talking about what went wrong so that we can fix it, so we can hit 1750 the next month. You'll hear that these guys never, ever, there's never excuses being said. Next, the focus is completely on the customer experience. Now, when we're talking about customer experience, right, we're not talking about like, let's get a bottle of water for Mr. Jones when he comes in, right? Let's hold the door for Mrs. McGillicuddy, right? It's not that. We're already, these guys are past that stuff. They're referencing things like Ritz-Carlton, Four Seasons, Nordstrom, right? This is the level of service that they're talking about. Once again, take that, take that into mind. Take that service mindset in there and plug it back in a couple slides ago into that process where what you're doing for these people, that total level of service, that's just the way it is. Like this isn't, this isn't anything special, you know? Number seven, they rely very, very heavily on their marketing. This is my favorite one. And 
when they're looking at their marketing, they realize that their marketing is what's going to drive people in to turn the wheel to make it so that the other six things that we just talked about can actually be done. Because if no customers come in the door, no cars can be sold. If no cars can be sold, everything I just talked about is completely to naught, right? Two very important things. Number one, one of them said to me, you cannot get an ROI without an investment. He actually said you can't get an ROI without an I. These guys are not afraid to spend money. I'm sorry, let me correct myself. They're not afraid to invest money. It's not about spending. It's about all 100% investment. And every single one of them, they also realize another very, very important thing. They realize the fact that not every single thing that you do that you invest money on can be measured in an ROI. I like to use this quote from, since Charlie brought it up, from Gary Vaynerchuk. Because he says all the time, what's the ROI of your mother? What's the ROI of the person who made the biggest investment in you? Or, uh, I'm sorry to say it, but maybe the smallest investment too. Right? What's the ROI of that? Can you measure that? No, it's impossible. Right? But have a bad childhood. Or, the contrary, have a really good childhood. What's the ROI on that? It's immeasurable. Bottom line, bringing the whole thing around, right? Every single one of these dealers, they all had a strong desire to succeed. Okay? I don't want to call shenanigans on anybody, but whenever I go to any dealership for the first time, I always ask the same questions, right? Two questions. Number one, why am I here? Sounds a little cocky, I know, but followed by question number two, what do you want to accomplish? The answer is always the same. 21 years, I'm waiting for somebody to change it on me. It's always the exact same thing. Well, I want to sell more cars and I want to make more gross. For some reason, it's always those two things too. I want to sell more cars and I want to make more gross. Okay, are you ready to, that's, that's a good desire, but are you really ready to do it? Like, do you really want to do it? Do you really want to put in the work, the investment, the risk? Do you really want to do what you got to do, no bullshit, to actually do what you just said, that you want to sell more cars and make more gross? As I was speaking to all of those dealers, right, all 12 of them, there was one little thing that was going through my head. Is like, are these guys really telling me the truth? Like, is this really the real part? You know, is this like the real stuff? So I asked one just, the other, just last week. I said to him, I was like, you're okay with me like sharing all this stuff with everybody? Right? And what he said, it just totally knocked me down to the point where I actually had to get a notebook and write it down. And I want to share it with you. He said, I don't worry about my competition. I bet on them not doing these things because it's hard and they don't want to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got dealers out there that are hedging their bets on the fact that you won't step up. They're hedging their bet on the fact that your boat is big enough, that you're happy where you are, that you look at the report that came out the other day and that you actually say to yourself, yeah, I'm good. But we all know that it's not true. So I challenge each one of you, right? I think by now everyone's figured out that the thousand cars is just a metaphor, right? It can be whatever it is that you want. If you want to sell a thousand cars a month, that's great. You know, go for it. Are you ready? Do you really want to do it? Do you really want to put in what's necessary? If you're selling a hundred cars a month and you want to do 500, are you ready? Do you really, really want to do it? Because if you do, you absolutely can. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, you can do it because it's being done already. So I'll be very happy to come here next year and hear from any of you guys that say, I saw what you said last year. You kind of pointed to me. I think I'm not sure. I think you pointed to me, but guess what? I doubled my business in the last year, right? That's going to be great. Thank you.